Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. And it is my pleasure to welcome Kelly here this morning. Thanks for being with us. Kelly Leonard is the Executive Director of Insights and Applied Improv at the Second City and Second City Works. His book, Yes And, Lessons from the Second City, was released to critical acclaim in 2015 by HarperCollins and was praised by Vanity Fair. This is what it looks like. And by the CEO of Twitter. Kelly co-created and co-directs a new initiative with the Center for Decision Research at the Booth School at the University of Chicago that looks at behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. Kelly and his co-author, Linnea Gandhi, wrote, comedy may be many things, but most of it is rooted in a recognition of our basic human behavior, and often our bad human behavior. Likewise, behavioral science provides an explanation of and a remedy for this same bad human behavior with smarter environmental design. Married together, comedy and behavioral science can open us to accepting our own errors and seeing a path forward for helping each other overcome those errors, often through simple redesigns of our environment. So hopefully he'll talk more about that later today. Kelly hosts the podcasts Getting to Yes And, for Second City Works and WGN Radio that features interviews with thought leaders such, such as Simon Sinek, Adam Grant, Gretchen Rubin, and many, many, many more. For over 20 years, Kelly oversaw Second City's live theatrical divisions, where he helped generate original productions with talents such as, let me know if you know who these people are, Tina Fey, Woo! Yeah, Stephen Colbert, Woo! Amy Poehler, yeah. Steve Carell, and Amy Sedaris, and of course, many, many more. Kelly lives in Chicago with his wife, Anne, and their children, Nick and Nora. Please join me in giving him a warm EBC welcome. Go ahead and get started. Well, Kelly, it's fantastic to have you here. I'm happy to be here. I'm switched on here. I think we're live, good. Yeah. Yep. Um, we find so often when we uh, get together on this stage that, that, that part of what made uh, the person that we're sitting with who they are is the experience of growing up in the family that they did. <laughs> so uh, walk us a little bit through that uh, circle. Uh, sure. Your siblings, your parents, and you, had, you characterized yourself when we met before the gathering today as a bit of an outsider and an insider world. Yes. So, so uh, explain that for us as well. Sure. Uh, so my, I'm the youngest of six boys. My mother is a, a saint. Uh, <laughs> uh, and w when my dad was in radio, and he was in Boston, and the station went rock and roll, and he wanted to do talk. Uh, so he sent out audition tapes, and he sent one to Chicago at WGN. They flew him out to sub for Wally Phillips for a week, and they hired him. So when I was one, um, my mom had to pack up the house and move us by herself across the country uh, and we moved to Chicago. So my dad was Roy Leonard at WGN. And uh, so a couple of different things that were interesting about that. One is we ended up living in Kenilworth uh, and we were the first uh, Catholics and Democrats in Kenilworth. Uh, to the point that when my parents went to go vote in the Democratic primary, there were no ballots. They had to go up to Lenko to get them because there's Jews there. Um, and and <laughs> that's the only ones on the North Shore at that time. Uh, so living in this enclave of wealth, and also, this is also funny, uh, uh, so we live, for any of you who know Kenilworth, we, we're on Cumnor right next to Memorial Park. Um, my, my parents did not live as wealthy people. We did not, even though we were in a very wealthy place, uh, we had no, we, like, we had no maid or anything. My mom hung out the laundry, so she had a, uh, you know, laundry that she'd hang out. And Kenworth, for the powers that be, were so upset by this, they built their own fence to hide it, <laughs> so you couldn't see it if you went down Kenworth Avenue. Um, so that that experience was in its, uh, of itself interesting, and then. And this is interesting, especially looking at the fact that I ended up working at Second City in sort of proximity to talent and fame, because that was my experience growing up with my dad, because he was interviewing all these incredible people, and he always took us to the theater and to concerts and to events, um, so I was constantly around famous people, uh, and, and my dad had a level of fame. Um, but when you have that little bit of distance, 
you get to sort of observe uh, behavior yeah. uh, in a in a more interesting way. I think I think you know there is some science around this that um, poor people uh, see more truth because mm. uh, they have to. Uh, it's a life or death situation. Um, and there's also science around the fact that the more money, the more power we have, the less truth uh, we see. People don't speak to us in the same way, um, and, and we have certain kinds of biases, and we all have biases. Uh, but uh, I think that the sort of observation of human behavior stuff ties together everything that I did. Comedy first, yeah. because so much of comedy is about recognizing human behavior, that moment on the stage where you're like, oh, that's totally like my wife speaks, or that, you know, that's, that's one of the earliest kind of ways that we process comedy. Uh, but then getting into this work with behavioral science and recognizing, oh, there's data and science behind this instinct. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the executive director of Insights and Applied Improvisation at Second City. That's a long title, sorry. Yes, it is. I'm glad it's there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have a book, and we saw, uh, yes, and, and it, it's being said that your book is one of the best books for teamwork advice in the boardroom. Now, um, how much of the book is from your improvisation workshops? And most important, when I talked to you on the phone, I was using the word team a lot, yeah. and you were using the word ensemble. ensemble. Yep. Right. Yep. So could you explain all of that? Sure. Uh, so indeed, uh, the, the book is, is a combination of uh, improvisational pedagogy, the stuff that's been taught at Second City for decades, um, and then my own experiences as, as a leader, and particularly my experience as being a bad leader. Because, I mean, like, first of all, you don't learn from your successes, you learn from your failures. And no one wants to hear about your successes, they're not funny. Uh, you want to hear about them? <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, no one wants to hear that. So what's fascinating about this is a little bit in the history and the roots of the learning. So what a lot of people don't know is that all the improv concepts that we teach and that have made all these people famous since 1959 when Second City opened, were actually games developed by a social worker at Jane Addams Hull House in the 20s and 30s. Mm. Um, so her name was Viola Spolin, um, yeah. and her job was to better assimilate immigrant children coming to her care. Wow. So she created all these games, that uh, many of which are in gibberish or are silent because the kids didn't always share language, but allowed them to come in and empathize and co-create and communicate. Uh, and, and so much of these games are about recreating recognizable human behavior Mm -hmm. which is why we've ended up working with people on the spectrum, because they don't have that practice. Mm -hmm. um, and we've all met people who can't pick up on cues, uh, and we've all met people who can't read a room, uh, all to very, I kind of think we're all on the spectrum, to be frank, but I think it's kind of <laughs> where we kind of are. Uh, but there, it is a spectrum. So uh, uh, knowing that, uh, that that's where this sort of, these, these, this pedagogy comes from, and then this idea of ensemble, which is so important to us, and the reason we don't use teams is because that sort of, that seems like competition. And there's a great saying that Sheldon Patinkin, who was one of our uh, early co-founders, uh, said is, you know, we've all heard the term, uh, your team is only as good as its weakest member. Right. We, we ship this. We say your ensemble is only as good as its ability to compensate for your weakest member. Mm -hmm. Because every one of us is going to be a weakest member, and we want to be picked up at those times. And it changes. And, and so when you have an ensemble orientation, yeah. Um, there are a variety of like rules, ethics, uh, uh, sort of uh, hidden handshakes that we all understand, that that's how we sort of keep the stuff together. Um, and that's the thing we forget. And I think, it, I mean, clearly, it's the thing we're losing in the world today. Um, we simply don't listen to one another. Uh, we don't see each other. Uh, we, uh, we get in our teams. We're in our tribes. We're wearing our t-shirts. It's, it's, it, and, and, we were talking about this before, yeah. in the digitized world, world now with social media, we were always bad at this, by the way, human beings are bad at this, now we're under attack because we're being nudged by these little, you know, uh, um, uh, emails and, and you know, Facebook messages or whatever that are all confirming our side or the other side. And our brains just work like that. Some, what someone said to me, you know, we've been um, running from uh, lions on the savanna a lot longer than we've been running for the bus. That's the way the brain is. Yeah. So this, this fight or flight mentality is up there. And so what, what I discovered was that, uh, and collectively what we discovered is that improvisation is kind of an exercise uh, in nudging ourselves to better pro-social behaviors. So you know, the, the work has gone in very interesting ways yeah. that, that 
Uh, if you just think about how you know Second City seems unusual, but then if you understand where it came from, it's the natural evolution. Right. So that is so cool. Yeah. You know, I think I think all of us find that really inspiring, and it actually increases my profound respect for Second City. You guys are, are doing some fascinating training programs now with for caregivers. Yeah. Would you unpack that? Tell us more about that. Yeah. So this is you know, and it stems a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this thing and then get to that. Um, uh, making yourself open to new experiences and to think divergently and to innovate and be creative becomes harder with success. Mm. So because you've got success, especially continued success, I mean, I had a really great run as a producer, mm -hmm. um, and I literally had to blow myself up to be in the position I'm in now. Right. I don't recommend that for everyone, so, you know, <laughs> hey, midlife crisis, go for it. Um, but I, I, I literally, like, I quit my job at Second City with, you know, nothing uh, to go to. My boss totally saved me, said, like, hang out for a year, we'll give you a consultant's contract. I literally, I'd go on vacation, uh, and I got this sort of new consultant contract, it was great. Go on vacation, and my office incinerates in the fire at Second City. You guys remember that? Oh. Uh, Second City Fun Fire? That was my office. I lost everything. Oh. No, no, you know, I did not, you know what, you know what uh, lived? A, a stencil drawing of Rod Blagojevich, and a <laughs> bottle of Rod Blagojevich shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> the treasure, the treasure. Which is plastic, <laughs> but has power. Uh, I had done a show called Rob McGuire Superstar that I came up with and produced, and, and so I had these tchotchkes around. That's all it's taken. But, so, so then what happened is I got, uh, we got put in these awful offices downtown, one of the sort of, you know, shared offices where they yelled at us for laughing too much. Literally got reprimanded for laughing too much. Uh, and, but I was forced in this uncomfortable situation with the people of the corporate division, and they were like, well, what do, you, what do you want to do? I mean, you got any ideas for us? And that's where a lot of this started start coming from. And it was in that office that I got a call from Adam Grant, who you guys might know, he wrote the book Give and Take, and Option B with Sheryl Sandberg, and he, he's a friend. And he said, hey, uh, I got a friend moving to Chicago. Will you like take her to lunch? And I'm like, like and when Adam asked me anything, you're like, yes, I will. I, you know, and her name is Ai Jen Poo. So we, we, we go back and forth, and about three months later, I show up for a lunch with iGen, and I didn't know anything about her. And I was basically, I'd come from a cool meeting. I go, do you want to hear about the cool meeting I came from? She's like, yeah. And this conversation has not stopped since then. So iGen is the uh, co-director of Caring Across Generations and the National Domestic Workers Alliance. You might know her as um, Meryl Streep's date at the Golden Globes. So this oh, year, when they all took the activist, that was right. iGen. Right. Um, and she is a badass. She is uh, a MacArthur genius grantee, an activist. Uh, she is uh, trying to, she works with domestic workers, many of whom are immigrants, and she is trying to deal with this aging crisis we have, which is a problem, people. Um, who's gonna take care of us? Uh, and we have a lot of people getting older. Um, but iGen does it with laughter and humor and comedy. They, her groups have funded uh, a comedy that speaks to aging populations, and they have a very unique way of going at this work. And she thought we were going to have a conversation about comedy. We ended up having a conversation about improvisation. And uh, my wife uh, came into this conversation, and we sort of said, why don't we see if we can create an improvisation for a caregivers program? Can we use the skills of improvisation to give individuals in these very difficult situations often, often a sense of agency, a feeling of ensemble? Because uh, it's, it's not enough just to talk it. You have to experience it and feel it to complete like a learning loop. So uh, iGen was curating Aspen Ideas Festival's Health Spotlight. <coughs> and we uh, gave a presentation, we did a workshop, and someone from the Cleveland Clinic took the workshop and was like, we have to do this. So they found the funding, and we actually just finished this, the first uh, 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 beta test of this. We did a six week program with 22 caregivers. Uh, leading them through a variety of improvisational exercises. Can give us an example. Right. Yeah, so, so um, uh, I, I, I com it combines with some of the behavioral science work. Can I just lead everyone through an exercise to teach you sure. about this? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna make you guys do stuff. Okay. okay. I gotta be careful. I swear all the time, and I don't want to do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just I like Nerd stuff. Is worse, don't stuff, okay. <laughs> <laughs> stuff is gonna be something else. Uh, in addition to the improper caregivers uh, thing that we do, I co-lead this uh, uh, program with uh, the University of Chicago around behavioral science. So we're gonna mix those two things together. So. Uh, yes and is the title of my book. It's one of the stickiest concepts uh, around improvisation. I want to lead you through a yes and exercise. 
I want to then take you into our behavioral science like flip on it, and then how we applied that to caregivers. So it ties it all together. All right, so I need you, you can stay where you are, but you're going to be in groups of two or three, depending on how many people are sitting at your table. So pick a person A and B, and possibly C if you're three. All right, do that right now. Who's A, who's B, who's C? I'm telling you right now, the person who's deciding all this is the alpha in your group. <laughs> okay, you're smart people, you should have it by now. Uh, here's the premise of, of this situation. Uh, this event has gone so great that we are all gonna get together in a year. We're gonna have a reunion, all right? So you guys in your groups, your A, B, and C, or A and B, are gonna decide where we're going to uh, and how we're going to reunite. Um, you know, a location, what are we going to do, is it a bigger event, small event, sky's the limit on this thing. Person A, you're going to pitch your ideas. Person B and or C, your idea in this one minute, we're just going to have you do it real quick. Person B or C, your job is to say no to every idea in as many ways you can. <laughs> Be creative, you are saying no, all right, go, do it. your idea for where the uh, reunion is going to happen, what's going to go on, and person A and or C, your job now is to say yes, but. All right, that's anything you can have, but it's a yes, but. All right, we're going to do that for about a minute. Go. Yes. say that yes but is like no with a bow tie. <laughs> That's what you're getting there. Okay, uh, uh, person A and or C, um, you are now going to pitch the reunion and the job of everyone in this conversation now is to yes and the idea, all of you. And the idea there is, is that any initiation you give, you, you say yes to that and you add something and then you keep adding. And I don't care how expensive this gets. <laughs> that is not for us to worry about in the yes and moment. All right, everyone, yes and now, go. <laughs>
if you're proud of. Uh, how did that feel? Everyone, just shot some awesome. words. Wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. High energy. High energy. Uh, hey, what did you guys decide on? What did your yes and lead you to? Uh, we're going to fly everybody to a private island uh, with friends and family. Yes. <laughs> and, and musical artists. And musical artists and Second City cast members. Yes. Does that not sound like an awesome gig? Yeah. Uh, what did this group, what did you guys decide? Uh, we're going to his home uh, country, Ukraine. We're going to have it uh, uh, at Yalta. We're, we're, going to <laughs> we're going to the Ukraine. <laughs> Oh, right. This is fantastic. I am going to do. Uh, this is the idea around yes and, and, and I give these conversations, I give these sort of keynotes to a lot of business groups. Um, and inevitably, when we talk about the yes and idea, there's a guy in the back of the room, and it's always a guy. Um, and he is like, if I yes and in every idea that came to my office, you know, I get nothing done. And like, there's two things I know. One is that guy's a nightmare to work with. Uh. <laughs> and two, he's misunderstanding, misunderstanding the concept. Because the idea around yes and is five minutes at the beginning of a brainstorm. It is a mindset and orientation at the beginning. We say no a lot in our work to edit to get to the incredible work that we do at Second City. But if you start knowing up top, you are missing everything. Because what innovation did people not think was great? That is, the, that is the, what is innovation is, right? Okay, so uh, uh, we're hanging out with the behavioral scientists at University of Chicago, one of our very first meetings. They're like, well, show us an exercise. And so we're like, oh, this is the one that we do, you know, all, almost with all groups. And so all these, and these guys, this is like top scholars. This is a, a Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize, is the one who greenlit our program. He wasn't in this meeting, but it's, it's that sort of level. So we do the yes and exercise, and this one scholar goes, well, you're doing it wrong. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't work for Second City, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I mean, you know, because of loss aversion. And we're like, I, what is loss aversion? And uh, what he describes to us at the moment, I know about it now, is that uh, science tells us that human beings hate losing something more than they care about gaining something. We do not want something taken away. So this is how people get elected, correct, uh, on all sides. Uh, talk, speak to what people are losing. Um, and so he's like, if you do it the other way, it's going to be a more powerful learning experience. So a week later, Mark Sutton, one of our instructors who was at the meeting, is like, well, I tried it. And I go, how'd it go? And he goes, well, um, the learning was deeper. And I go, great. And I go, what was the problem? Because he had this look in his face. He goes, they were so pissed off, I couldn't get them back for the rest of the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so this whole idea of like, because we always start the workshop with that. And these people were so angry about having to be no to each other. It didn't work at all. So I said, thank you, scholars. We're going to keep the more performative aspect of our, <laughs> our work. Uh, but what this led to was an ongoing conversation. We're like, wait a sec. Think about that. Yes, and is so powerful. People get it when you do it. How do we continue the exercise to deal with the no, to deal with the conflict that happens when we do disagree, when we get to the point where we have really difficult conversations that we have, have to have? How can, we, how can we gamify that? And we came up with the idea of a fourth pillar. I'm not going to lead you through it because it's kind of a long one, but it's called thank you because. And the idea here is when we get into a thorny conversation with someone, um, the way that we stay inside that thorny conversation is thank you because. We thank the person for their information, even if we disagree with it. But the, because, the because is crucial. And then what our job is to, to say back to them what they just said to us and why we know it's important to them. And this speaks to a scientific uh, understanding of how people see themselves. It's called uh, self-verification theory. And the idea of self-verification theory is that people want to be seen as they see themselves. They don't want to be seen as their prettiest or best selves. They want to be seen as they see themselves. So if I see myself as clumsy, it's important that you see me as clumsy so you don't throw me a ball. But I'm a human being. I'm complicated. I'm not going to say that. And thank you because gives people gratitude. The gratitude part of their brain was thank you. And then you've heard me. You've seen me. And then if you do that to the next person, you're going to be able to stay inside this difficult conversation. And with the Improper Caregivers Program, this is exactly one of the things we got to. So we're in Aspen, and we have everyone, we're like, we want you to share your caregiving story. None of these people knew each other. And we said, and we're going to do yes and, and we're going to do the thank you because. The thank you because, like, uh, yes and goes really loud. This got intimate. People were crying as they're talking to each other. We let it go for like 15 minutes. And afterwards, this doctor raised his hand. He goes, I know that's the way I'm supposed to listen and speak to people, but I don't do it. I'm ashamed. And we're like, don't be ashamed. I mean, look at the world we live in right now. No one's doing it. No one's talking to each other or listening to each other. 
So, so that's just one core principle that was part of the program that we do early on to get people to share their stories. And that's important, right? Storytelling is important. It's, it's how we see the world. But then how to hear other people's stories. And, and if there's, again, the world we live in, right? If there's anything we need right now, is to sort of t tear down these artificial walls that we're putting in front of each other to try to get some idea of shared truth. Wow. Yeah. Worth the price Very of admission. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll move on. Yeah. You co lead a new partnership with Booth yeah. School at the University of Chicago. Yeah, they, they, they hate us and love us. Oh. <laughs> And you studied behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. Yeah. Can you tell the benefits? Yeah, so, so you know, the stuff we just talked about, and, and it, it goes much further. Um, there's, this is interesting. So Nick Epley, uh, who is uh, one of our lead scholars, very interesting, very smart man. He wrote a book called Mind Wise, which I, I uh, recommend. Uh, it's funny, uh, I, I often talk about Nick, and I, at Second City, we don't tell jokes, really. We, we do humorous sketches and improvisation. Uh, and Nick's book has a joke, and I, I use his joke because I like his joke, um, uh, which is a man walks up to a river, and he sees another man on the opposite side of the river. And he says, how do I get to the other side of the river? And the guy yells back, you are on the other side of the river. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, that is hu that's humanity. That is, that is how messed up we are. Uh, and, uh, and so... Nick studies that, and one of his studies that he's working on right now is his belief that small talk actually uh, makes it harder for us to get to truth between people. Um, and so the kind of stuff that we do in the, in the Second Science Project, which is the name of our program, is we build executive education programs that companies buy based on the stuff, and we do research. So what we're doing with the research, we'll take you know 16 level A classes, so around 200 people, we'll split them up, Half of them will uh, do small talk before they try to get to an important topic, and the other half needs to get right to the heart of the, uh, of the product. We film it, um, and we measure it, and we see what the results are. Um, and so far, Nick's theory is bears out, uh, which is the more we sort of beat around the bush, um, the harder it is to get to the important stuff. We wildly, and the science is clear on this, we wildly overestimate uh, how difficult and awkward conversation is going to be. And don't we all kind of know this? Like, every, we, we, we spend so much more time freaking out about the difficult conversation. And then when we have it, we're always like, oh, OK. And even if it was bad, it's like, ah, it wasn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> and this is something that I really struggled with as a leader, not with the talent. I could be, for some reason, brutally honest with the talent and maintain relationships. But with my own staff, many of whom, like, I, I, have, I have people on my staff when I was producing who, who basically were in charge when I was 26 year old, when I was 22 wow. and, and came in. So it was very hard. Yeah. And my friend Kim Scott, uh, who has a great book called Radical Candor, has a theory around feedback. And, and she, she has a concept called ruinous empathy. And that's when you care so much you're not going to say a thing. Mm. And that, if I look at my biggest failing as a, as a leader, it was among my people who I cared a lot about. Uh, and there were some real problems. And I just, couldn't bring myself to really talk about the thing. I'd beat around it, maybe get them some training, but never attack the problem head on. And that does nothing for you. So it, it's, it's sort of like, and, and by the way, people misuse radical candor. It was just misused on Silicon Valley. They used it in a bit. Because the other side of that is you want radical candor, you don't want obnoxious aggression. This does not give you permission to yell, scream, or be mean. The only way radical candor works is a person across from you knows you love them. Yes. Mm. Wow. But there's ruinous empathy. Ruinous empathy. Wow. Oh, yeah, I cringe when I think about it. I read that in the book, and I'm like, that's me. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's probably all of us. Mm. You. It said that uh, a day without laughter is a day wasted. Yes. And I know you're a huge advocate for the power of laughter and humor to open doors. Um, how How do you see? Uh, the function of, of humor or laughter in the workplace, and what are the benefits that it brings? Yeah, uh, here's an interesting thing to know. Uh, so Second City Works, which sells into the corporate community mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of work, it's about an $18 million company inside Second City. Um, if we tell people we sell comedy, they ain't buying. Huh. They buy improvisation. They also don't buy play. 
I mean, we're doing all that. They're not interested, like, I'm not buying a play. Tell me about this improvisation. <laughs> um, uh, and the field of academic study does not want to fund comedy. So I have all these academic friends now, and a group of them at Stanford, Wharton, and Harvard all want to study comedy and can't get the grants. We can get it for improvisation. But comedy is usually important. Uh, it is the way we communicate, just in the advertising and marketing field alone. The amount of people who use comedy without a license is off the charts. Um, and my friend Nir Ayel has, has a phrase that if it can't be used for evil, it's not a superpower. <laughs> and comedy is a great example. Uh, my wife is a comedy professor, so I, I crib from her. Um, but uh, uh, think about it. Uh, comedy can be used to unite us as, as tribes, and it can be used to otherize. You know, the history of racist comedy um, the, the exclusionary aspect of, you know, this is our people, here are those people. Comedy does that very cruelly mm -hmm. and very powerfully. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can do the opposite. It can sort of bring us into a room, a shared laughter. Here's some interesting science. Uh, they've just recently done some neurological studies using fMRI machines. And they discovered that the same part of the brain that processes an insight is the same part of the brain that processes a joke. Not a leap if you think about it, because a joke is often simply a pattern interrupted. So you have to first understand that the, the joke, you know, the, the, whatever the setup was, didn't go where you thought it was, you knew where it went, you went back there, you laughed. And this is what an insight is. Yeah. It's I didn't expect this, I see it now. Um, and so we have, a, we have a thing that we sell at, at Second City in the corporate work that I love called Brand Stage. And it's, uh, uh, it basically reimagines the focus group. So we will take a brand, they'll have like, we did this for uh, uh, a product that I can't name uh, for a Super Bowl commercial that became a Super Bowl commercial that I will or will not say had Bill Hader in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, keep it to ourselves. Yeah, keep it to ourselves, come to silence. Uh, and what, what basically they said is like, we've got, this, we've got this can that we think is iconic around our product, um, and we put it through a brand stage, which meant we, we got a bunch of improv performers and artists, producers, directors, writers, actors, improvisers, musicians. We brought them into the theater. Uh, we brought in audience, which would normally be a focus group, but there's an audience, and it was the, the audience they wanted. We turned on the lights, and we played with the product uh, in a variety of different ways. And the way you get to insight is, what are they laughing at? Because when you talk to them later, they're not going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Focus groups don't tell you the truth, you know, for a variety of reasons. They want to please. They want all these human things. But you, you can't hide a real laugh or a real groan. Uh, and so we mine insights out of that moment. And so we do this with products, we do this with uh, concepts and ideas. Uh, we just partnered with WPP. They actually invested a lot of money and are our full-time partner uh, in this program. Um, and it's, what I love about it is it's basically like it's mini Second City for someone, you know, in their idea or their product or whatever. That they get to, and we, do, we treat it like that. It's like, no, it's gonna be in a theater. There's really gonna be an audience. We're gonna create, create a script out of this. We're gonna give it to you. Um, and there's something inside that process. I think part of it is also that everyone is required to be in the room together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the Hamilton thing. I want to be in the room where it happens. It's like, we don't put everyone in the room. And it is the biggest mistake. I was talking to a tech guy. He's like, you know who always comes last in these meetings after you decide everything? It's like, well, then let's talk to tech. You're like, who, who's going to do this? <laughs> like, wouldn't you want them in early? Yeah. Like, and, but we don't. We don't open our rooms enough. And we have to find more of that in theater has always been such a beautiful expression of that. It's, it's just a, you know, in many ways, uh, I think, well, I know this from history, that uh, sort of religious religion and theater has a very common yeah. you know, core. In terms of people coming together, uh, there's all the rights uh, that you experience. Uh, the lights come down, you experience this thing together. Uh, and then you talk about it. You know, the best thing is, like, this, this is what a theater producer dreams of, is that you're, you know, certainly a comedy producer, is that you're driving home, you're laughing, 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 laughing about the show, and then you realize that moment of truth that came in the show, and the car goes silent, and you're like, oh, that, yeah. that's the best, the best comedy. Uh, when we talked, I told you about the backstory, backstage story that I had with Bill Murray at yeah. one point. So it's not up to me to tell that whole story now. It's up to you to tell us. A good, a good backstage yes. story? I got a good one about Bill Murray. Oh. Uh, so, this is before my time, but it's. Did the you take mine? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> this, is, this is the stuff of legends. Okay. Uh, so, back in the day, uh, this would have been the 70s, um, Joyce Sloan, who was the producer at the theater at the time, she would drive the van when the touring company would go out and do gigs, colleges, performing arts centers. And we had a gig at Notre Dame. 
It might have been St. Mary's. Uh, and the, the uh, chancellor, or, or president of the university, had a party afterwards after the uh, event at, at his residence. Um, and so everyone went, everything was great, all going, and they're driving home in the van, and they're close to Chicago, and Joyce is like, it's freezing in here, close the windows. And uh, Bill Murray's in the back seat. He's like, it's fine, we're almost there. It's like, no, close the window. And she's like, why would you not close the window? And she pulls over the van. And what she then realizes when she gets out of the van is that Bill Murray had stolen the rug, expensive carpet from the chancellor's home and was holding it on the roof of the van. <laughs> 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 and so they're like 20 minutes from Second City and she turns around the van. It's like, Bill Murray, you're gonna return that rug. Get back there, ding dong, he like comes down in his, you know, robe or whatever, and I'm very sorry, I stole your rug. <laughs> and exits. And that that is that's Bill Murray. Oh my god. Do you have another one? <laughs> we're, we're dying here. Uh, yeah, so Col I got a, I got a kind of a cool one about Colbert. So Colbert was my wife's roommate in college. Um, my, my wife and I, uh, uh, I proposed to her on the dance floor at his rehearsal dinner. Oh, um, so wow. we've got a close relationship. Um, and Stephen is, uh, if you don't know this, um, uh, he's a rather serious person. He's hilarious, mm -hmm. uh, but he's a, he's, a, he's a person of faith, uh, taught Sunday school for his kids. Um, he thinks deeply. He, he, didn't, he wanted to be a poet jerk. He didn't want to be a comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, but my wife, uh, he, they were living together, and he was making futons in their basement to pay rent, and they were not good futons. <laughs> you know, because he wanted to be a carpenter, because he wanted to be Jesus. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and so she's like, she got him a job uh, selling t-shirts at Second City. And uh, he held a record for most t-shirts sold for years. Wow. Uh, but she was very proud of him. Um, so uh, when I became producer in 1992, my first cast had Colbert, Carell, Lady Sedaris, that group, oh. just a bunch of has-beens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were in the process for a new show, um, and we created a scene, a scene called Spelling Bee, um, which was killing. Like, it came out of the gate. Hilarious. Dark. And it was basically a children's spelling bee. Colbert and another actor, David Brzezowski, were disembodied voices giving the kids these words, but the words were all really mean, um, applied to the archetypes of the kids. So the, the one girl who had the you know, dental stuff, her word was caramel apple. <laughs> and, and being Second City, we took it to a very dark place. Uh, and Naomi Shapiro, played by the Broadway actress Jackie Hoffman, uh, got the word compass, and she goes, can you use that word in a, in a sentence, please? And Stephen goes, yeah, your people killed Jesus, compass. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, grown as good, as good as a laugh at our work. Uh, so terrible. Uh, and, and so Stephen, this scene is like the best scene in the show. And Stephen comes to my office and he's like, we need to pull spelling bee. And I go, why? Mm. He goes, I don't like the laughs it's getting. And I go, it's getting great laughs. What do you mean? He goes, no, it's getting blood in the mouth laughs. And so we had this long talk about the role of satire and the role of the satirist. I go, you're not, you, you are showing anti-Semitism. You are satirizing this. You are giving people insight into this. And even if they don't understand at the moment, they are gonna understand at a certain point. Um, and, because I didn't wanna lose the scene because it was funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, but more importantly, we got into a real, real conversation about this. And I bring this all up to then realize that moment, because it was many years ago now, but I remember my wife and I in bed watching the first episode of the Colbert Report yeah. and thinking to ourselves, like, how is Stephen going to keep this up because he's saying things he doesn't believe yeah. over and over and over again? And here's an interesting note about that. That character is not based on Bill O'Reilly. I mean, the concept is, in terms of, of, of that, that character is based on NPR's Noah Adams because Stephen found him insufferable. <laughs> he wanted, wow. And he loved language. Wow. And so he wanted a character who played with language. And also to think that Colbert was the one talking about truthiness. Yeah. How long ago? Right. Like, we live in the truthiness generation. Yes. Right. So, so some of the stories are funny. Some of them are profound. You know, T Tina Fey is, is one of the great human beings of the world. But here's the thing to know about Tina Fey. She totally has your back if you're um, uh, an honorable person, a good person. Uh, but she also, because she is so smart, um, she knows the thing about you that you hate about yourself, and she will use that in a minute <laughs> if you wrong someone. Yeah. 
And it's a, it's a fascinating, and, and part of what she thinks is in her observational ability is because she has always seen herself as a deformed human being. I don't know if you know about her scar. When she was a little girl, the doorbell rang, very young girl, and someone came in and cut her face <gasps> with a razor. Oh my so God. if you see it, she has a scar right here. Huh. So she always saw herself as an other. Yeah. Uh, but in that, felt that she could see the world a little she bit more could. accurately. She yeah. could. Well, she has a superpower now. She yeah. sure does. Yeah. I just saw Mean Girls on Broadway, too. It's great. Oh, really? I went with my 15-year-old girl. With my, my daughter was just she was in delight, and I was sort of in delight with her. It was really good. You've talked about uh, Anne, your wife, uh, mm -hmm. so many times, and we'd love to dig a little deeper there. T tell us a little bit more about what she does. Yeah. And, uh, and do you guys use your knowledge of behavioral science and stuff <laughs> in your home? I mean, I'd like to meet these daughters in here. Oh, yeah, my, my kids, my son and my daughter would have a field day with this. Yeah. Uh, all right, so yeah, uh, Anne, Anne's the smart one in the family. I, she absolutely is. Um, uh, I was married, we were both married before, and actually caught the bouquet at my wedding. Huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she went, she went and got married, and both of us got divorced at the same time, and then there were the, we were the rebound relationship, relationship that 23 years later is going good. Um, uh, so she's really evolved because she directed at Second City, she was an improviser, um, and then she became a college professor as well, and created this comedy studies program with Columbia College in Second City where you can come as a junior or senior um, for a semester and get full credit. It's like, it's like a, a semester abroad. Uh, but you are steeped in the history and analysis of comedy. Uh, so these kids, like it's, you guys, like this class, <laughs> You'll literally be walking by and they're listening to Bob Newhart records yeah. or they're watching <laughs> Marx Brothers movies and you're like, I want to go to there. <laughs> I want to go to there. Uh, the kids love Ernie Kovacs. If you don't know Ernie Kovacs, yeah. like Ernie Kovacs is contemporary comedy but done in you know the 50s. Um, and, uh, and they really bond. A.D. Bryant on Saturday Live was in one of the very first comedy studies uh, programs. And then a few years after that, um, uh, Anne uh, created the full comedy major at Columbia, so it's a four-year program. They have 275 majors, as she says she's every parent's living nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not really true, because most of like, like especially the dads, they really want to talk to her about comedy. Yeah. <laughs> they always kind of like, do you know this? It's like, yeah, I, I teach this. Um, so that's been an incredible program, and yeah, we, we have a 20-year-old and a 15-year-old. Um, they, they're, they're, I mean, they're annoyed by us, uh, generally speaking. I, mean, like, I got an honorary doctorate, so like any time I screw up, my son calls me doctor. <laughs> um, and you can imagine how many times I get called out for saying no. It's like, oh, nice, yes, Sam guy. A couple tricks that we've learned is when the kids were little and they used to fight in the car, um, we would make them play one word story. Uh, so uh, what we would do is say, okay, we're gonna play one word story, and that is where we need to tell a story one word at a time. And a couple different things happened. We had a shift in focus, right? So suddenly focusing not on fighting, but on the story. Uh, but one of the things we discovered with our daughter, um, not a natural improviser, Nick was, Nick always was, and, and, and Nora's a very good improviser now, but she was not natural at it, because uh, every time the story would come to her, she'd just say something like hippopotamus. <laughs> really, what was needed in that story was a the or an and. Like, I don't want to say a the or an and. Like, and this is where you can translate this car with kids experience to your boardroom right now. Right? There's the one person in there is like, you know, all I need is for you to say the, and you can't do it. And that is our job. Our job sometimes is to do the the or the and to keep the, the story going. And you'll, you'll get the adverb, you'll get the verb or the adjective, they'll come to you. Uh, Nora often would have, we'd be at the dinner table and we, we coined a phrase that she's delivering a Nora log because uh, you go to these monologues where it's like, no, no, like, you have to learn to share the conversation. And I think really in the playing of these games around the dinner table and in the car, um, they began to be able to uh, pick up on the cues. And then they took, they took improv as well. Um, and uh, so, so improv's hugely important and comedy is hugely important yeah. because like, yeah. man, life ain't easy. Right. I mean, this is the thing. Some I was doing a talk the other day, and a college student came up to me and said, "Can you give me, like, an important piece of advice?" I'm just looking for like, what do I actually need to know? And I, and I came up with two things. One was when I became producer of Second City, and I was 26 years old, and it was like not like I should not have had that job. I was in no way qualified. 
um, and it was Ann and I were married to other people at the time. Uh, but I remember she said to me, because I asked her for advice, and she said, uh, when you make a mistake, say you're sorry. And I've done that through my life, and it has served me very well. And the second piece of, of advice I gave this person, and I truly believe it, is I said, what you need to understand is that 99% of us think we're frauds. I do. You can Google me, and I look really cool. But my colleague Kirk is out here, and he knows I'm an idiot. <laughs> in, in the best way possible. I mean, like, we all, like, and the people who don't think they're frauds are sociopaths. You need to kill me. <laughs> 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 no, you know, like, like, I don't think I'm smart enough or pretty enough or good enough, or I ha and, and I know all the mistakes I've made. Someone says, said to me, I asked someone, uh, no, it was in a podcast interview, he said, the only regrets I have are uh, acts of unkindness. Yeah. And, and I've been unkind in my life, we all have, and I regret that, you know? And so part of the journey um, that I've sort of been through is letting myself off the hook to do better. Good. And, and this is the thing we don't do enough of right now. Mm -hmm. You guys know about the whole Simpsons controversy right now? Yes. With Apu? Yeah. So, so, the, so the Apu character, if you've been watching Simpsons forever, is done by a white actor, and it's a very racist stereotype. Um, it didn't feel that way for decades when we all enjoyed the show. But you know, there's there's you know uh, uh, comics of color and and, and uh, of Asian descent who are calling this out, and rather than like fix it, uh, they basically in last week's episode did a thing where Marge was trying to read an old uh, children's book of hers to Lisa, had to take out all the racist stuff so the book meant nothing. Like I get that point, I get that point, but that's not the point to be made right now, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like it's a mistake. Move on. There's Second City scenes we can't do because they have words in it that are not cool anymore. That's okay. Right. Right. There's plenty of plenty of highway here, guys. Right. Especially for The Simpsons. I mean, my God, brilliant show. Mm -hmm. It's just really disappointing. Yeah. Well, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> We're closing on racist stop who? <laughs> Last question as we're doing this? No, you can't. Okay. <laughs> it's yes, yes. Yes, 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 What is the project you're most passionate about right now? Um, I mean, the, the, all my projects. Uh, I, okay, here's one just like this day. Um, and I've talked about this with a couple people here. Uh, I interviewed Ori Brothman. Um, who's a well-known Berkeley professor and writer, and he has a new book with uh, Martin Dempsey, the joint chief, former Joint Chiefs of Staff, called Radical Inclusion. And after the conversation, Ori's like, we should talk more about collaborating, because he and Martin, their, their biggest contract is with the military. And the, the idea here is the Navy SEALs don't need to learn how to improvise, they know how to improvise. Most people you know, fighting these battles, they improvise. Um, it's inherent in what they need to do. Um, the people who don't improvise are the people making the decisions. Mm -hmm. So they want to bring this work to the top brass, and the idea around radical inclusion is we've always had a difficult time with the truth and understanding what the truth is, especially in combat, because I'm going to sidetrack this, but, but I was I'm talking to a professor, and he's like, every history of war is a lie. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, think about it. Um, how do you get to the truth in, in any situation? You have to interview a lot of people who are there. You have to interview people from different perspectives. So even if you inter interviewed like 100 people in battle, what are each of those people, what are they seeing in battle? Right? right. So, so you're getting third, fourth, fifth, sixth hand, seventh hand from who? Um, and the idea around radical inclusion, which is very powerful, which is so, especially in the social media world, where mistruth is amplified and weaponized, um, only through radical inclusion are you going to get to understand every close to truth, which means you need to be talking to your enemy. It means you need to be talking to the lowest person on the rung and the highest person on the rung. You have to create environments where people feel comfortable to speak truth. And this is an antithesis to a lot of hierarchical military behavior. Yeah. And we're increasingly in this decentralized world, which does not operate with the hierarchies. You do not battle terrorism with a hierarchy. You have, to bat, you have to become decentralized to it in, in order to do that. Yeah. So that, that project right now is on my brain because I never expected an army guy to be talking about inclusion. But, it, but he's talking about inclusion at the best possible way yeah. because it is inclusion writ large. Right. With big, big stakes. Yeah. yeah. 
We're gonna open it up. Um, Ala is going around and she's got a microphone. Do stand up, tell us who you are before you ask your question. Hi, Kathleen Yasko. First of all, thanks for lifting my spirits today. I have a comment and a question. Uh, I knew Joyce Sloan, yeah. a wonderful woman, mm -hmm. uh, and she was on my board for years on the west side of Chicago Hospital Board. Yep. And she was generous, uh, not only a comedian and, and funny, uh, but also of spirit interactions too, so miss oh, her yeah. a lot. Me yeah. too. Uh, my, my, my question was, when you were talking about caregivers, what level of caregiver are you talking about? The actual clinicians or the people yeah. that work in the home or the family members? Great question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's kind of all of it right now. So the, the, the improper caregivers program, when we presented at Aspen, I forgot to tell this part of it, uh, the Cleveland Clinic program is for in-home caregivers. So mostly family members dealing with maybe uh, a parent or a husband or wife who have, has Alzheimer's or dementia or some. And one of the ideas when you think about yes and, the studies in dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's, what you shouldn't do is block them. Don't say no to them, don't block them. Yes and, but their reality. Because their reality is their reality. And living it for a little bit is immensely pleasing and can bring you back to where you need to be. That's, that's, that's one example there. However, the other person who saw us at, at Aspen was John LaPook. John is a, a physician at NYU. He's also the chief medical correspondent for CBS and 60 Minutes. And uh, he's married to Kate Lear, Norma Lear's uh, daughter, who's also cool. Uh, he, John, we had dinner, and he's like, don't tell Kate I showed you this, uh, but Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner for their wedding did the toast as the Thousand Year Old Man. So it was like they, they did a classic comedy routine. So, so John hooked us up with uh, NYU and uh, uh, Joan Kelly, who's their chief uh, patient care person. And uh, we are training uh, their staff. So we started with the patient care people and the uh, chaplains. Um, and we were just talking about this uh, earlier. In our conversation, I asked, uh, and this is sort of getting, getting all the information to design the workshop, I said, do, you, do different people in the hospital need to listen differently? I'm like, oh, absolutely. And so the patient care people need to be listening to the patient to figure out where to send them. That, so they're listening intently on, I need the cue to know if you need to go to you know, a heart specialist, a this or, or, or what. The uh, chaplains simply need to practice generous listening. I had never heard that phrase. And I was like, I am gonna sit with generous listening because I love that. They're just there to be and, and be with someone. Uh, and what we realized is all these people need to listen differently and they're not, they don't know that about each other. They might kinda. Uh, so part of what we're doing in our training is establishing this, this intelligence around how different people in this caregiving health space need to listen and then let other people know, oh, by the way, know that your colleague, you need to help them because they need to hear this. Uh, and we think through a more holistic training model where people can collaborate more effectively because that's where medicine needs to go. We need to treat the whole patient. Um, that that can be, uh, uh, way more effective. So part of where we do a lot of health and wellness work that's been very disparate. Uh, so some corporate, because they hire us for this, some like the improper autism program we have and improper social anxiety, which is run through the training center. So I'm really trying to now in my new position be like, let's try to get this under one roof. Let's, let's get this, because we can, we can then develop our superpower to help you know, lock a lot of communities in, in a situation that is truly, I mean, you know, I just lost a brother um, in going through that experience the difference between the caregivers who came in and gave a crap and the ones who weren't listening meant everything. Oh, yeah. and, and so the stakes are too high. We, right. we all have to focus on fixing And it's too expensive. Everything's too you know, crazy. We gotta fix it. Over here. Hey, uh, Kelly, good morning. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, inspiring breakfast and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Jim Kales, I'm the CEO of Aspire and we focus on lifting up and including kids and adults with disabilities into the community. We do a lot of job training for adults with autism. So could you try to dive a little bit more into the improv for autism? Yeah. I'm curious how that can help adults with autism in the job world because that's where we find a lot yeah. of struggles are. A black and white situations, great. Gray, not so good. Gotcha. So our partner is a group called Giant Steps in the suburbs, um, and we, we're, we're basically building our intelligence there. We, we, we started the program at Second City in Chicago on a hunch. This is what happens, like, and someone like you will take a class at Second City and go, oh, by the way, you could use this with my community, and we're like, all right, let's do it. 
um, and then it becomes a one-off class. We're trying to get more purposeful and, and pointed, so we're building up more intelligence with giant steps. We, wanted, uh, we, need, to, we need to research, and we need to um, evaluate and measure. Uh, but at, at, and I referred to this earlier, uh, when you look at the, the autism spectrum, um, it, so many of our great innovators were likely on the spectrum. Steve Jobs, uh, Edison, uh, Tesla. I just interviewed a, a woman who wrote a new book called uh, Melissa Schilling from NYU, a book called Quirky, which is about all these geniuses. And she's like, oh, clearly, like basically all of them with the exception of Ben Franklin were on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, so at one level, uh, simply getting people uh, practice in recreating human behavior um, and, and get, building up the Q muscle. That's, that's at the, the most basic level. We just talked to someone at Ernst & Young. Their job is to hire uh, people with, on the autism spectrum, in part because what they're recognizing is they're divergent thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we tend to, as mere mortals, uh, think in our patterns and stay in our patterns. And a lot of uh, people on the spectrum, because a lot of them get into comedy, I know those, um, they think divergently. They're making all kinds of weird connections that we're not making in their own. So there's sort of tapped potential there. And I'm not an expert, so I don't want to pretend to like, you know, speak to the, the condition and the science on it. I just know what I've observed and been part of those conversations. Um, but increasingly, uh, uh, we're finding our work allows for individuals to practice being a human being. Um, uh, and essentially, it's a practice in being unpracticed. You know, so, which, which is how we exist in the world. Um, and it screws us up. It screws us up when we've got everything working for us. Um, and, but you know, most of us have you know, things that knock us, knock us down and we need to get back. Kelly, thank you so much for being here. Matt Pollack, um, you talked about your family. That's yeah. how you got into comedy. I'm curious about why. <laughs> like, what do you believe about comedy that's made you dedicate your life to it? So the, the reason I started to work at Second City is that I actually wanted to be a playwright. Um, and my dad got me interviews with uh, Rock Schulfer at the Goodman and Bernie Sollins, who had founded Second City, but was starting his new theater. And both of them said, if you want to work in theater, work in a theater. Um, and uh, Rock, who still takes credit for my career, didn't give me a job. Um, <laughs> uh, Bernie, who actually sh does have credit for my career, got me a job washing dishes at Second City. But I went there to be a playwright. Uh, and, but interestingly, because I didn't know that they used improvisation to create comedy. And I'd always been a comedy fan, and I'd always been relatively funny. Um, uh, but then I got there, and I, and I, figured, I, I just discovered that they were using improvisation, and I looked at my background, and I'm like, oh, I, I was a deadhead uh, who loved jazz music, improvised jazz music, who wrote my thesis on spontaneous jazz writing by Jack Kerouac. Like, I was steeped in improvisation just from another angle. Um, and then what happens when you work at Second City is you end up in this sort of like vortex of brilliance around comedy and improvisation, comedy and improvisation. And the thing I loved about comedy, I, I was talking to someone the other day about this, I said, any problem at work is probably a communication problem. Kinda, most of it, you can kind of boil down to that. And what I find about both improvisation and comedy, but I'll talk about comedy in particular, is that it's an incredible device uh, for getting to truth. Uh, uh, comedy allows you to say the thing that you shouldn't say. Um, it's how you speak truth to power. I have a story in the book. Uh, the Second City Holiday Party is this thing that we've got every year where the night staff uh, puts on a show lampooning us, uh, the people in charge and the actors. Uh, and they use the scenes of the current shows uh, to do parody you know, commentary on, on all of the things we screwed up during the year. <laughs> And one year I was there, and this waitress uh, uh, was singing a song with her other waiters, and literally walked down out of the theater right up in front of our owner and says, you can dress up a pair of blue, she blue jeans, why do I not have health insurance? Ooh. It was like, it wow. was so awkward and great. Uh, and, but this is what happens in Second City. She doesn't get in trouble. Andrew calls us into the office the next day and says, how do we get them health insurance? And we got them health insurance. Wow. Yeah. That wouldn't have happened if someone hadn't felt like they had permission to speak truth to power. Right. And the problem with power right. is they don't want to hear truth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Wow. Time for just about one more here. One more question. 
lot of pressure. Make it a good one. Make it a good one. But I'm disappointed. Uh, Kelly, Greg Mashing. Uh, so this is dovetailing with your uh, previous answer. Who do you think right now in the comedy space is doing well at speaking truth to power while also not promoting otherizing or confirming biases? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think Samantha B is amazing. Um, and I like that she is not afraid to, you know, yell and point a finger and then uh, will also point it back. So like when, oh, who'd she sit down with? Uh, Glenn Beck. I don't want to see this. It was yeah, Samantha B and Glenn Beck sitting yeah. down together, having a nice conversation. Yeah. And it's like, this is weird. And she got really criticized on the left for that. And I'm like, come oh, on. Yeah. First of all, it's funny. Right. Um, uh, her work is very strong. John Oliver, I think, is oh, a genius. Amazing. And the thing about Oliver that he gets to do, the problem with the daily shows, and Trevor Noah's great, Colbert's great, all, all those daily shows, is they just have to find the humor in the moment. And what Oliver is allowed to do with that long segment he has each show is like, let's dig into this. Yeah. And let's see what the truth is and let's be funny about it, but let, let's figure out what's going on there. And I like, I have conservative friends. I mean, I'm left of now. Let's, I mean, you know, <laughs> of course I am. I'm a theater guy in Chicago. Um, uh, and I often have sort of like my conservative friends, and I do have a few, uh, will be like, why are there no conservatives, you know, in comedy? I'm like, comedy is about punching up. It's not about punching down. It's not funny when the power group uh, starts making fun of the group underneath it. That's not funny, that's cool. Um, so it naturally has always been a domain for people to criticize those in power. So it's not just liberal and conservative, it's you know it's the shots we've taken at the church. I mean, my mom, like, like if we mentioned the Pope or a Kennedy, like I would get a stern talking to. Like, I did not write the show. <laughs> they cannot work by your values. Uh, but you know, and, and yes, it was harder to it was harder to go after Obama, um, but we we found ways to do it. Um, I think really provocative ways to do it uh, uh, at the time. Um, but yeah, the I think the 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 thing about comedy. Here's the thing too, right? We talk about truth tellers. You know, we no one trusts the media anymore. It seems. So who are we going to? We're going to the comedians. Mm -hmm. We are at least feeling like they have some level of, of understanding or reflection for us. Bill Maher. Bill Maher, certainly mm -hmm. for some people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, there's a swath of them who are, who are out there do, doing this work. Right. Um, and, and it's important work, but you know, we, like, it's, the burden's too much on the comedians. <laughs> Let's, I think it's, it's, it's up to all of us to sort of right that ship. With that final wise word, we wanna just express our thanks uh, to Kelly. Chicago for the healthcare, scientific, and IT fields. He came highly recommended. I'm very excited to do his pre-interview soon. Uh, Medic's dedication to placement excellence has resulted in remarkable growth. It's been featured on such prestigious lists as Crane's Chicago Business's Fast 50 and largest <coughs> privately owned businesses in Chicago. Also featured on Inc. Magazine's Inc. 5000 list of the, na of the nation's fastest growing private companies. Uh, so please Register if you have any questions about how to get more involved with the club. If you had a good time here today and this is your first time here, come see me after the program. I'm very nice. I'll answer all your questions. Um, Kelly, are you able to stick around for a couple minutes yeah. and answer some more questions? Great. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah.